welcome uh, everyone online to the first TES interview and the first interview is going to be with Toby Young. Um, most people will know who Toby Young is, he's done a huge variety of things, uh, but most famously probably at this point is as the Chair of Governors and co-founder of the West London Free School. So I thought it would be a good idea for us to talk to Toby about some of his experiences in schools and some of his thoughts about schools in general and perhaps educational philosophy behind it. Um, don't forget that if you want to contribute or participate, you can do so on Twitter using uh, the hashtag... TESchat. TESchat. Thank you very much. Thank you, producer. Okay, Toby, thanks very much for, Thank for, for having us over today. Um, one of the first things I wanted to bring up was perhaps your own experiences in education. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you came from a school with very few levels, clutch, a clutch of A-levels, which perhaps by um, Tony Blair standards would be considered to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you ended up with a first from Oxford and then went on to achieve so many different things. So what does that, what does your own experience at school tell you or inform you about how education was perhaps in the 70s and 80s and where it was then? What's in that? I think my view of progressive education has probably been coloured by having gone to Crichton Comprehensive mm. for two years. I was in year seven and year eight at Crichton in Muswell Hill. It's now Fortismere, um, uh, which is one of the best uh, comprehensives in the country. Um, but back then, it was a kind of hotbed of progressive experimentation. Mm. It's just one example. They had a seven-day timetable. So Monday would be day one, the following Monday would be day six, Tuesday day seven, yeah. and then Wednesday would be yeah. day one again, which meant the entire school was constantly at sixes and sevens as to where they were supposed to be at any one time. I mean, timetabling was a nightmare. Yeah, sure. Even the staff couldn't get their heads around. And then the idea was that it would somehow kind of um, uh, uh, liberate everybody. They'd be freed from the force of habit to think more creatively about the curriculum and they'd be better able to learn. And mm. God knows what crackpot idea was behind it. Um, it was run at that time by Molly Hattersley, then the wife of Roy Hattersley, mm -hmm. um, and um, the governing body was made up uh, entirely of members of the local Labour Party, um, and um, it was, it was a, I had a bad time there. Um, I was shot in the eye by um, a kid um, with a gat gun um, in the playground, um, and this kid <laughs> was suspended for two days, and then was back in the playground by yeah. the end of the week yeah. uh, with his gat gun. Um, so that wasn't a good experience. And then I went to another comprehensive um, in Devon called King Edward the Sixth mm. Comprehensive uh, in Totnes, and um, didn't have a great experience there either. And failed all my O levels apart from I got a C in English Literature and a Grade One in CSE Drama. Congratulations! And <laughs> thank you. Um, and, uh, and, I, and 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 I retook and eventually went to William Ellis, and I was in the last. Uh, grammar school year, what is now a comprehensive in North London, in which Fiona Miller, funnily enough, was the chair of government. Mm. Um, and that was a much, much better experience. I think for the, for the first time I felt um, uh, that the staff really cared about the progress I was making in lessons. Um, I felt kind of noticed um, in a way that I hadn't been at my previous two schools. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, there were, the staff had quite high expectations of me in a way that the staff at my previous two schools just hadn't. Sure. And they really pushed me and uh, encouraged me to apply to Oxford, even though at that stage that looked like a pretty pie-in-the-sky ambition. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Time. Um, and uh, it was really the experience of being at a fairly traditional school um, with really good teachers who had very high expectations of all the pupils, and he really pushed me to work hard mm. and fulfil my potential. I think it was that, that definitely informed my wanting to set up uh, a school of a similar kind yeah, in sure. West London. Did that, sorry, did that, were you aware of that at the time, when you were at these two different schools? Mm. I mean, as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, how conscious of you of the way schools were being run, and, 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 and did you have a kind of a, a perspective on that then? Um, I was quite, um, I guess I was, I was quite rebellious. I mean, I must have been quite difficult to teach um, as a teenager. I can't think why. Uh, and um, uh, I think... Uh, I think the critical thing for me is that having done really badly um, up until the end of um, Key Stage 4, mm -hmm. um, had, had I not had a kind of supportive, educated, stable family background, um, that would have been it for me. I mean, it almost was it. I left school at 16 and um, mm -hmm. did a work experience scheme and cleaned toilets, worked in a garage, did some washing up, 
um, as a condition of signing on, similar to what's being introduced yeah, now. Yeah, of course, sure. Such a fuss is being made about. Um, and uh, and initially thought that I would just I would you know I would embark on a kind of career as a sort of manual labourer. Um, and uh, I think that you know without without the support of my family and without those expectations, I definitely would have kind of uh, fallen through the cracks mm -hmm. of the education system. And I guess I feel now that it's really important. Uh, that children who don't have the advantages I had um, uh, are given much more support and pushed much harder and are educated in much more disciplined, structured environments. Yeah. Um, because uh, if they don't come from the sort of background I come from, that, that's the, really their only chance. And if they screw it up, they're never going to get a second chance. Yeah, I see it's a quite powerful experience which you've kind of carried into adulthood. Um, moving on a little bit, you were also the co-founder, co-editor of The Modern Review, yeah. which had a motto, if I, I can recall, is to bring... It Lowbrow culture to highbrow people. Well, it was it was low, our motto was low culture for highbrow. Yeah, we, we, even more succinct. <laughs> that kind of links into education, I think, in the sense that what kind of culture do children need to be brought to them? Do they need lowbrow or highbrow culture? Well, at the time, um, uh, me and the group of people who set up the Modern Review, this was in '91, felt that popular culture um, wasn't being given yeah. the respect it was due. Um, it was still looked down upon mm -hmm. by critics in the broadsheet press. You know, people like Clive James would would review television in a slightly sneering, kind of contemptuous way mm. because it was popular. Uh, and similarly, there was this contemptuous attitude towards kind of blockbuster Hollywood movies and best-selling books, genre fiction in general. So we thought we wanted to kind of address that, and um, uh, 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 and, and because we all kind of had this kind of passionate interest, uh, which was to a great extent, informed by our tertiary education mm -hmm. um, in mass culture. Uh, we thought it was kind of, it was time to kind of redress this. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we employed intellectuals and academics and sort of clever journalists to write about things like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Madonna and Stephen King. Yeah. And at the time, it was relatively revolutionary. Um, now, it's not at all. I mean, now it's absolutely, absolutely big. And yeah. now, if I was setting up a magazine, you know, in my 20s today, I would think seriously about setting up a magazine whose motto was um, high culture for lowbrows, to try and bring <laughs> a bit of high culture mm. to the masses. And I guess now when I see the kinds of things that are taught in the Edexcel English GCSE curriculum, you know, there's a, I think there's a, there's, there's a, I was recently a parent pointed out to me that there was um, a unit called Talent Television in which um, children are expected to study the ITV1 homepage of Britain's Got Talent, mm. along with a cover of Hello magazine and so on and so forth. When I see that sort of thing in uh, the GCSE uh, syllabus, uh, I think, oh my God, you know, was the Modern Review partially responsible for <laughs> yeah. the various intellectual revolutions that enabled this kind of thing mm. to take place? I think this, the standard response that a lot of English teachers would say is that while they accept that something like Heat Magazine or X Factor uh, homepage... While it may not be classic literature, I say may not be, um, <laughs> but it can still be used for meaningful exercises in English. I mean, how would you respond to that? I think, um, I think that the purpose of education um, shouldn't be to um, enable children to um, articulate the kind of embryonic opinions which they already hold and to self-actualise mm -hmm. in that sense. That's a sort of romantic idea that children are essentially, have the seeds of perfection within them. It's a Rousseauian idea and you just have to kind of bring it out. Mm. Um, I think that the purpose of education should be to introduce children to a world they're not already familiar with mm. and to introduce them to opinions which they don't already hold. Uh, and so I think uh, encouraging them to kind of think critically about um, things they're already thinking about uh, is really something that sh that's secondary and that the primary purpose of a good education, uh, particularly up to the age of 16, uh, should be to introduce them to, yeah. um, you know, in shorthand, the best that's been thought and written, because they're never going to get another opportunity to be introduced to that. I mean, people say that if you have a good education, uh, it doesn't really matter what you're learning, so long as you learn how to learn. And once you've acquired this skill set, you can then apply it to all kinds of uh, other bodies of knowledge, yeah. and you can pick up you know, a classical education after you've left school. You know, you can read the complete works of Shakespeare, you can familiarise yourself with Dante's Inferno, whatever it might be. But the fact is, you know, I studied philosophy, um, you know, at Oxford, Cambridge and Harvard. I was passionately interested in philosophy until I eventually left Cambridge, where I even taught it for two years. Mm. I haven't cracked the spine of a philosophy book since. The, 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 the brute
brutal truth is that if children, young adults, don't study uh, the best that's been thought and written, you know, in the first 25 years of their lives, they're never going to really do yeah. it uh, in, the, in, the, in the next 50. I, I, mean, I hear you, and what you're saying, I suppose, brings us to the idea of the, the, the classic liberal education, I, w- I would assume. One of the things many people say to me is, isn't that kind of uh, idea of you know, the, the great book theory of education, that yeah. you should have read these hundred books, could that be perceived as being you know, culturally elitist or oppressive in some way, because essentially it's you know, a list of a hundred dead white men? I think, uh, I, th- I, think, a multicultural I, think, society? I think that was an inhibition about um, uh, uh, classical liberal education and contributed to it going out of fashion in the 70s mm. and the 80s, even in the 90s. Um, uh, and it, it was linked to a kind of postmodernist critique of uh, the canon. Um, but uh, I think that, 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 that the, uh, f- the winds of fashion have begun to turn. Mm. Uh, and I think one of the reasons Michael Gove has been more successful than some of his opponents expected is because um, he is actually going with, beginning to go with the grain rather than against the grain in promoting uh, a more traditional, canonical, great books approach. Um, I think it's, it's, it's mad to imagine that the intellectual heritage of the West um, the greatest books that have been written, the greatest plays, uh, the greatest p- pieces of music, um, should somehow be um, associated with an elite, with the upper class, mm. and considered their exclusive preserve. Um, they're for everybody. And to deny ordinary people access, uh, or to not introduce ordinary people to them, because uh, you imagine they, can't, they won't be able to relate, because it's so alien to their everyday experience, is to deny them. Um, uh, the extraordinary benefit, the enlargement of the human soul that comes from being properly acquainted with mm. these great works. So would you, would you say that the proposition elitism for all is a coherent one or, well, or not? Well, um, I don't see... I mean, I think that... Um, I mean, that, 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 sounds, that sounds reasonably coherent. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, so. I, think, I think excellence for all is, um, mm. is, is, a, is a trickier... Safer one. Uh, uh, no, I think that's trickier because how can everybody... Be excellent. Above average saying everyone point. should be above yeah, average. Yeah. Um, but I think um, I certainly think that uh, we, we, we 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 describe our school as a grammar school for all the West London Free School, and that means that we think that all children, no matter what their background, no matter where they are in the ability spectrum, can um, can access a classical liberal education and uh, can benefit from being introduced to you know the works of Shakespeare, of Plato, of. Mm. Uh, Whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the grammar school there. Would you welcome a return to a tripartite system? Well, I like to think that um, uh, that the experiment, which is sort of informally taking place at schools like high school, at Mossbourne Academy, at other academies, um, and in some you know, community schools, um, which are essentially uh, trying to um, deliver a grammar school curriculum to a mixed ability cohort of children. I'd like, to, I'd like to think that that experiment will be successful and um, people will raise their expectations of all children, mm-hmm. uh, no matter what their background, no matter where they are on the ability spectrum, um, as a result of these schools succeeding, of showing that it can be done. Sure. And in that way, you won't need to reintroduce uh, selection or to extend grammar schools in order to... Um, uh, in order to um, uh, defend teaching this kind of thing yeah. to spread the teaching of a more classical curriculum. I think I think everyone can benefit from it. And, and in my kind of ideal uh, future, um, uh, every school, every secondary school, um, will be introducing um, a classical liberal uh, curriculum to all the children in the school. Mm. You mentioned there that your ideal future. Now that brings me on to something I was going to ask you. This is kind of fantasy football time. Yeah. Um, you have suddenly been whisked from your present position, whether willingly or no, into the role of Secretary of State for Education. I imagine you had that kind of that position. Right. Um, what What does day one hold for you? It's funny you should ask that question because um, because uh, you are now Secretary no, of State for Education. No, no because um, uh, I asked a, a, a head teacher that I know, who was until recently the head teacher of one of the best conferences in England. Uh, was asked that question by Tony Blair. If I made you Secretary of State for Education mm-hmm. tomorrow, what's the first thing you'd do? And he said, I'd take every civil servant in the Department for Education, uh, line them up against the wall and machine gun a lot of them. Um, I don't sure that's a popular, <laughs> popular view, yes. I don't think I'd go quite that far. Um, but um, uh, I think that um, 
I, I do think that granting uh, schools more autonomy, um, provided uh, there is uh, some accountability at the same time, um, is is a way of raising standards. More autonomy um, than the, even the academies. Uh, no, I think I think uh, I think I, think, I, think I, I would like to see I would like to see that the freedoms currently enjoyed by academies and uh, free schools to be extended to every school. Mm. Um, and uh, often you hear the argument; it's occasionally made by Stephen Twigg uh, that um, if a freedom is good enough for one school, mm -hmm. why isn't it good enough mm -hmm. for all? And if we're not prepared to extend it to every school, let's not extend it to any. Which is, I mean which isn't quite the same argument as the argument I just made. It often sounds as though that's mm -hmm. an argument for withdrawing the freedoms that the last government and this government mm -hmm. has extended to academies and preschools rather than an argument for extending those freedoms to every school. And I'm slightly concerned that um, some of the freedoms that uh, the West London Preschool currently enjoys, such as the ability to set pen conditions, for instance, um, and uh, 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 that some of those freedoms will, um, will be withdrawn by um, a Labour government if mm. Labour are elected in 2015. Now that's, that's very interesting you mentioned the being conditions there because again that's something that a lot of people mm -hmm. have asked me to, to, to mention mm -hmm. to you. Now free schools are obviously exempt from the, the, the kind of statutory mm -hmm. being conditions which exist throughout the, the, the state sector. Why is that a good thing would you say or is it a good thing? It's, I think it's, 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 it's a good thing because um, uh, well, one of the ways in which it's a good thing is that um, you can employ staff who don't necessarily have um, a PGCE in the subject you want them to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, um, when we started, our head of classics um, didn't have a PGCE in classics, not least because it's actually quite hard to get a PGCE mm -hmm. in classics. Very few teacher training colleges actually offer PGCEs in classics. I think you do it in King's and, and Birmingham. Um, and uh, uh, she, uh, in the course of being at the school, uh, has got a PGC in classics, which she did part time, or she's been at school. She's now got a PGC in classics, but she didn't when we employed her. But sure. that wasn't to say she wasn't qualified to teach classics. She was the head of classics at a leading independent school, which is famous for uh, teaching classics. Yeah. Um, so she was eminently qualified. She just didn't have the relevant bit of paper, the union sanctioned piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, that flexibility, which has now been extended to academies, uh, uh, is tremendously valuable and I think it's um, something that all schools could benefit from. Of course the, the teaching unions don't like it because it means that you enlarge the pool of potential employees and sure. if you enlarge the pool that weakens the bargaining power of the trade unions. But generally speaking, um, you know, it's, no, it's no secret that I'm not a particular fan of the teaching unions and don't think that they generally have the so welfare of the people at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, uh, what, 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 what some flexibility around pain conditions has enabled us to do uh, is we, we can pay um, uh, our staff um, slightly more uh, than they'd be paid at uh, the neighbouring community schools. We pay London weighting plus 1%, uh, and that's enabled us to attract, I think, uh, a really good staff. Mm. Um, but uh, I think one of the, one of the, one of the um, uh, mechanisms buried in the documents uh, that the unions have uh, drawn up with the Department for Education mm. uh, is um, a clause which makes it very difficult for schools which um, are bound by the National Pay and Conditions Framework um, uh, uh, not to uh, close down when a small minority of the staff call, go out on strike mm -hmm. because it's impossible under within the Pay and Conditions Framework to cover the striking teachers except under you know exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I do think the way in which um, a minority of uh, trade union militants can hold secondary schools to ransom uh, is not a good thing. So that's one another reason I approve of more flexibility in paying conditions. But, is, but isn't this uh, undoing the, 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 you know, perhaps you may say the very good work that unions have done over the past, say, 100 years? I mean, a, after all, there is a reason why unions exist, and surely that's to protect you know, the workers from the, from, from the managing age of staff. Isn't there a danger that um, management will take the free school liberties and, and, and essentially erode workers' rights. Um, because you say, you say you pay more, which yep. sounds fantastic, and Michael yep. Gove said a very similar thing last weekend, mm -hmm. um, which sounds wonderful, but mm -hmm. surely there's no safeguard or barrier to prevent that from uh, being inverted. Well, one safeguard is uh, employment law, um, which uh, really does limit um, uh, an employer's room for manoeuvre. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, as you know, it's, it's fantastically difficult to um, sack a bad teacher, and if you saw that 
episode of Panorama a couple of years yeah. ago, which has examined how many teachers have been struck off by sort of teachers council for incompetence and the GTC, yeah. and it was that was it was an, it was an incredibly small number. Mm -hmm. I think that reflects just how hard it is uh, to move on underperforming teachers, and that's not because of the paying conditions document, or at least not just because of that, it's also because mm. of the employment law. Um, so I think there are already a lot of protections, particularly as long as we remain in the EU. Um, yeah. But I also think, you know, there's, uh, there's um, the, the, to a certain extent, um, the market protects teachers because um, if they find conditions particularly onerous uh, in the schools they're teaching at, they can always move on and work at another school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, one, of the, one of the things I'm realising is that um, the teaching profession is quite a peripatetic profession. And teachers actually move on an awful lot. I mean, mm. They move around yeah. an awful yeah, lot. lot of that, yeah. um, and uh, so holding on to them uh, becomes an absolute priority if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a governor of a school and you want your school to succeed. You really need a bit of continuity, you know, on the stuff. Mm. And uh, so you know, we're very anxious not to kind of alienate our teachers by suddenly by paying them less or cutting their salaries mm. or imposing kind of uh, onerous working conditions. So, so that the, so the, the market will. Will, will solve some of those problems. I think the market will solve some of those problems. Employment law will solve the others. I don't think uh, uh, the unions um, need be too worried about. I don't mm. think teachers need to be too worried about uh, the bargaining power of the trade unions being weakened by granting more freedoms to, sure. uh, to, to schools. Whenever I mention your name to teaching colleagues or, or people I've never met on yep. social networks, it's impossible. It's almost impossible to have a conversation about Toby Young's politics and educational philosophy, without having a conversation about Toby Young, if you see the difference there. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that you seem to attract, you seem to be such a lightning rod for strong opinions, mm -hmm. shall we say? I mean, what's, your, what's your take on that, as, as the person in, in question? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's probably a combination of the fact that, um, you know, I'm, I'm um, a journalist um, and primarily um, uh, you know, an opinion writer. Um, hmm. And uh, have been now for you know almost 25 years. Mm. Um, I currently write a politics column for the Sun. I write a weekly column in the Spectator. I've written you know opinion columns for virtually every paper on Fleet Street. I continue to write op-ed columns for various papers for the Wall Street Journal quite frequently. Mm. Um, so I'm a sort of professional opinionist. Sure, I'm professionally opinionated. Uh, so it's not surprising that. Um, uh, uh, People are often kind of divided by what I say. Well, what's and that's, that's, that's the nature of being a kind of um, a being professional sure. opinionated. Of course, you're, you know, you, you, if, if you weren't, if people, if you weren't kind of dividing people, um, if you weren't provoking people, you wouldn't be doing your job properly. And I guess a, a bit of that has bled through into my other kind of role mm. as now co-founder of Referee School and chair of governors. Mm. Um, and uh, some people um, criticise me for sort of saying kind of provocative, controversial things about education and education policy um, now that I wear two different hats yeah. and say that yeah, it's irresponsible that, yeah. in my capacity as chair of governors of a publicly funded school to take up these various controversial positions. But I'm not sure that um, you know, being a chair of governors means that you have to kind of uh, uh, muzzle yourself mm. and keep your opinions Vanish. to yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think you, you probably... I mean, it's hard enough to attract good people to be governors of, um, of schools. And I think if you insisted that they kind of took a vow of silence as a condition of accepting the job, it would become even harder. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, education, I've found as well, is, is, is just an, you know, an incredibly controversial field in which it's almost impossible to take up any position without sure. instantly kind of alienating a large number of people, particularly on Twitter. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it just seems to come with the territory. It's become a kind of education policy is a battlefield in which all these other battles are fought by proxy. Um, it's uh, it's almost like a, you know jousting almost in the uh, mm. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so I think I think you know you just have to accept that um, that, that quite a few brickbats are going to be thrown at you mm. in the course of uh, taking up any position. Uh, you, in the you education field. Well, you don't seem to mind it very much. I mean, do you enjoy it? Um, I does, does, part of, does part of you yeah. love the love the thrill of it? The I fight. Quite, of it? I quite I quite yeah. I must mean, do, I, shall I, we? <laughs> I do like a good so scrap, um, yeah. and uh, I enjoy sort of arguing, um, uh, you know, with Fiona Miller on television and mm. on radio. I mean, in, it, my father was um, a lifelong socialist um, for years, a member of the Labour Party, mm. wrote the 1945 Labour Manifesto. At the kitchen table growing up, you know, I was surrounded by kind of um, 
uh, left-wing intellectuals kind of engaging in these kind of uh, impassioned sectarian disputes. Um, so I'm absolutely used to um, the kind of buzz of argument and kind of uh, energetic disagreement being part of you know my life, and uh, so it doesn't it doesn't upset me uh, <laughs> in a way that it might yeah. perhaps someone brought up yeah. in a different sort of environment. Yeah, sure. Um, bringing you back now to your school, the West London Free School. Um, two years in, mm-hmm. the year seven, a year eight, enormously oversubscribed. 1,300 people subscribed? We've just uh, said that 1,300 people have applied for our 120 places next year. Now, that is, by any standard, an enormous uh, vote of confidence from the local community. And yet, while you were setting it up, there was a great deal of local protest against it mm-hmm. from the local MP slaughter and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, perhaps you could talk us through your experiences of setting up, the, yeah. some, some, of the, some of the battles you, you fought in setting this up. Yeah, well, it, 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 did, it did become a battle. I mean, I think... Uh, um, our school became the flagship free school partly because yeah. you know, I was willing to appear in public to defend the policy and talk about what we were trying to do. Um, and uh, uh, so it became a kind of lightning rod um, and attracted a lot of national opposition to the free school's policy. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was uh, vilified by the NUT and the other teaching unions as well as various kind of uh, left-wingers of various descriptions. Um, and, you know, it, it got quite personal at times, um, and uh, 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 sometimes it became a little bit hard to take. I remember having Sunday lunch here mm. with my family, and um, because being involved in education uh, at this level is so incredibly time-consuming, I mean, for me it's like 60 hours a week and it's all unpaid, and my wife slightly resents the fact that I, <laughs> I spend all this time on the school, mm. not enough time with her and the family. I like to kind of have Sundays, well, Saturdays and Sundays with them, but I remember discovering that Fiona Miller had written a blog post on the local schools network, yeah. which is sort of ground zero for left-wing opposition to free schools and academies, mm-hmm. um, saying that um, my group was in the process of evicting um, some vulnerable, handicapped oh, children yes. from a building. And, yeah, it was, reading that. and it was just complete balls from start to finish. And um, and I had to stop having lunch and, um, and address this kind of immediately in a comment beneath that. Mm. blog post and at some t- a point it got frustrating um, having to constantly be engaged in this war with the opponents of the policy um, and you know it was definitely a battle to get the school um, mm. set up and open um, but uh, and you know, the local MP Andy Slaughter was pretty vociferous in his opposition and um, uh, he said that the school was completely unwanted in the borough that there was no demand for the kind of education we were offering it was uh, it was just a completely surplus to requirements mm. a total waste of taxpayers money etc etc um, and so it's quite satisfying now um, uh, for for our school to be the most oversubscribed state secondary school in Hamilton and Fulham probably one of the most oversubscribed schools in England sure um, you know more than ten applicants now for every place and I think what it shows is that um, uh, that that what we're offering really strikes a chord with um, with local parents. Mm-hmm. The idea of offering children from all walks of life, from every part of the local community, a classical liberal education, a kind of education that typically would be associated with the kind of uh, uh, public school elite, uh, trying to offer that kind of education to everybody um, uh, is enormously popular with parents. And it's not just you know white educated middle class parents either. Um, you know, at our school, for instance, 50% of the kids have English as an additional language. In our current year seven, 33% are on preschool meals. Mm. It exactly reflects the sort of ethnic diversity of the local area. So this isn't a privileged category. It's fine. I mean, the notion that um, that uh, that a classical liberal education in which sort of Latin is mandatory in key stage three, um, that mm. that will only appeal to the educated elite is completely condescending. Mm. Um, you know. Every parent wants their child to have the best possible start in life and the best possible education. And for many parents, that means a classical liberal education, no matter where they come from, what their background is. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, and if you, if you look at uh, who's benefiting from the education, who's really thriving in our school too, it's uh, it's amazing how uh, uh, universal uh, the response to the kind of education we're offering is. So, for instance, our highest achieving demographic in our current year eight is girls on free school meals. They're doing better uh, subjects like Latin than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like you know, it's not it's really suitable for kind of one particular strata of society, mm. not for the rest. You know, everybody can <laughs> everybody enjoys it. 
why, uh, why did you personally get involved in education? I mean, you've been involved in so many different fields, and all of a sudden, Toby Young is in education. Where did that come from? I mean, um, were you bored? <laughs> uh, no, it, was, it came from having children. Um, I've got four children, um, currently aged nine, seven, five, and four. Um, and um, uh, they're all at uh, a, a good state primary school mm-hmm. uh, in Chelsea Bush. Um, but uh, inevitably, I started thinking about where they were going to go to secondary school. Um, I went to state school throughout my educational career. My wife um, went to a state sixth form. Uh, we, want, we want our children to go to a local state school. Mm-hmm. We believe in that. Um, uh, and we, we don't qualify for places at the local Anglican school or the local Catholic comprehensive. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there are some good local community schools, but um, most of them are massively oversubscribed, and unless you live within, you know, spitting distance of a school gate, you don't have a hope of getting in. And there did seem to be a dearth of uh, good free secondary schools mm. offering the kind of classical liberal education that we want for our children. And um, my wife's initial response was, well, we're going to have to move. And um, she tracked down this quite good comprehensive in um, uh, Suffolk called Thomas Mills mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and uh, found out a bit about house prices in the local area. And you know, the, whole, the whole thing was set in train. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to have to turn my life upside yep. down and move halfway across the country just to secure my children the kind of state education I want for them. Mm. Like, was that I, the breaking point? That was the breaking point for yeah. me. It was, it was a kind of stubborn kind of frustration, a sort of boiling over in thinking, why should I have to do this? I pay my taxes. It's not a great deal to ask that I should be able to get a comparably good education to the local Catholic children, the local Anglican children, the local mm. children whose parents can afford to send them to private school. I should be able to get that in my neighbourhood every family should be able to secure that kind of education for their children if they want to, without having to move, without having to turn their lives upside down. Mm. Why should I just you know, stick to the rat run, the maze that's been created for me by the state, which really isn't serving mm. my needs? And I thought, well, bugger that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put up with that. I'll, I'll, I'll bloody well start yeah. the kind of school that I want to send my children to. So why not just go to private school? Well, we didn't want to send them to private school. I mean, not least because um, you know, I see... I see the kinds of children um, <laughs> uh, that my friends' children are becoming in virtue of having <coughs> been to private school. I mean, it's. Uh, <coughs> I think there, there are cl- clearly there are some there are some excellent independent schools out there, and some of them have been kind of very helpful and mm. friendly. Um, and I'm sure they're watching us. Um, <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, um, uh, the kind of values that children absorb at independent schools are not the kind of values I want my children to have. Um, you know, that they, they become kind of mini plutocrats who become obsessed with going to, you know, uh, the party at Bougie being thrown by Roman Abramovich's 16 year old mm. daughter, whatever it might be. They, they're sort of like micro, <coughs> little, they're little kind of mini me versions often of the kind of person I was when I was in New York, kind of going to parties and trawling around town, working for Vanity Fair. Is that the most terrifying thing? Well, I, I don't want my children to, mm. I don't want them to end up kind of just shallowly just caring about kind of status and money and um, going to the right parties. I'd like them to care about more important things. And so my fear is that if I send them to private school, Mm -hmm. um, they'd end up, you know, like that. Um, Why should the taxpayer pay for the kind of education you want for your child? Well, it's not costing the taxpayer any more to educate uh, my children at the West London Free School than Mm -hmm. it would be to educate them at the local community school. Um, so the taxpayer is going to have to pay for my children's education willy-nilly unless yeah. I elect to send them to, to a private school. Um, so I don't really get that argument. I mean, it, 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 one of the kind of um, arguments that was often made when I was helping to set up the West London Free School was, you want a private education for your children. Why should the taxpayer pay for that? If you want that, mm. send them to a private school. Um, well, if it's not going to cost the taxpayer any more, to give my children the kind of education mm. they might have at a good independent school, then what's the objection? And also, if in the course of setting up this school, I extend opportunities to other children in the borough, mm. such as the 33% of the children, there's 40 kids in our year 7 currently on free school meals, there's about 25 in the, no, 30 in the year, mm. year above on free mm-hmm. school meals, you know. Um, if, if, if it's possible to deliver... Um, for no extra cost to the taxpayer, the kind of education that 
the vast majority of parents in this country want for their children. Mm. Uh, you call it a private education, if you will, call mm. it a classical liberal education, call it a grammar school education, whatever you call it, that seems to be what the lion's share of parents actually want. And actually, a majority of parents in all the polls say that if they had the money, they would send their children to private school. Mm. If you can deliver what parents want, if you can deliver that quality, that type of education, at no extra cost to the taxpayer, then, you know, what's the objection? Doesn't that hurt the other schools in your area? Doesn't that draw children away from them? Well, um, competition, essentially. Yeah. Um, w w there's sort of two versions of that argument. One version is that there just aren't enough kids to support all these places, that in setting up free schools, uh, like, like the West London Free School, you've mm. created surplus places, yeah. and therefore Which if children come to your school, yeah. there'll be gaps in the neighbouring schools, and they'll have less money as a consequence, and they'll enter this kind of downward financial mm. spiral, and so on and so forth. Well, that argument doesn't apply in West London, because there are too few there are fewer places than there are children, and that applies in the primary sector, but it also applies in the secondary sector. Uh, in, in Hammersmith and Fulham, for instance, um, more than 50% Sorry, in Hammersmith and Fulham, less than 50% of the children of secondary school age are educated at state secondaries within the borough. So, you know, there's a huge dearth of secondary school places in the state sector um, in the particular borough where my school is. So there's definitely a need uh, for more uh, secondary school places. So, so that argument doesn't apply. Um, and um, Michael Gove gave an answer in the House of Commons um, uh, when the second wave of free schools were approved, I think last October, uh, in which he made the point that, October 2011, in which he made the point that uh, the, uh, I think about 80% of the free schools that he just approved in the second wave were in areas where there was a, a, a need, a basic need for additional school places. So the idea that free schools create places which are surface to requirements is it's basically a red herring. We're in the midst of a massive population. Mm. Um, the other argument that, that, okay, you won't attract children, um, you, you, you won't mean that the neighbouring schools actually have you know, less children than there are places, but you'll attract the most motivated yeah. children. Well, um, I think that uh, uh, that's a bit like John Prescott's argument against the City Academies programme that he made in Cabinet when Tony Blair first ran academies up the flagpole, which is the problem if you start a really good school is that all the kids in the neighbourhood want to go to that school. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an argument for preserving mediocrity rather than for trying to create centres of excellence. If you want to create centres of excellence, of course, um, you're, one of the potential consequences is that all the most aspirational, well-informed families in the neighbourhood will want to send their children to good mm -hmm. school. Uh, but then the response to that is not to say all schools should be exactly the same and completely mediocre. Um, because otherwise you're going to have this kind of disequilibrium. The response is, well, let's make the other schools better. Uh, and all the evidence is, both in Sweden and in England, is that where, where you do have a good school, either, either a school in a particular neighbourhood that radically improves as a result of converting to an academy, or as a result of a new school opening like our school, it doesn't actually have a negative impact on the neighbouring schools. They do raise their game to try and compete with... Uh, these beacons of excellence, uh, and that's the way you know that that's the way it works in most industries. Um, if if a if a car company um, is manufacturing great cars, mm -hmm. um, uh, and as a result, a neighbouring car company isn't selling so many cars, you don't say, "Oh, let's stop Mercedes doing what it does well and make sure it doesn't produce cars which are any better than British Leyland." Sure. Um, let's make British Leyland cars better, mm -hmm. and you know, that, that, and that drives up standards across you know, every sector um, in society. There's no reason why it shouldn't work that way in education, and all the research evidence is that that is how it, how it works. Mm -hmm. I think we're almost at the end of our time now, so I'd like to leave you with one question. You were, um, you're famously and, I guess, fairly fictionally portrayed by Simon Pegg in How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. Yeah. Any uh, plans for a, a second film based on your experiences in free schools? Um, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I got a short answer. I can't, I can't see. I can't, I, mean, I can't see. Um, I can't see anyone <laughs> paying money to go. Can't see the there. drama in that at all. Um, I think uh, I, I want to write a. I want to write um, a book. Um, I'm on the hook to write a book for Penguin, mm. um, which is part a kind of polemical argument about contemporary education, and part educational memoir describing mm -hmm. my experiences at school. So in some ways, a sort of prequel. To how to lose friends <laughs> and alienate people, but I don't think I, I can't see um, I can't see me selling the movie rights. Okay. You know.
to all of you. I'll, I'll see if some things available. Anyway, um, I just would like to say thank you very much thank for you. your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. Thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight, and I'm sure you can leave your views on the TES web portals as per usual. Anyway, thank you very much, and good evening to you. Thank you.